Okay. Well, uh, first of all, thank you all for coming by. Really appreciate it. Um, we've been doing these meetups uh, for for a while now, um, and there's been sort of a you know sort of a break the last four months. But we're doing them again, right? We have uh, we've made them available again. I'm really happy that a few people came. Um, I was sort of wondering if this is not one of those meetup groups that is completely dead or what is going on. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for coming by. Also, thanks for following your RSVP. Um, that's always great. Uh, we have four amazing speakers tonight. Um, but before we get to that, uh, just a little bit of little bit of housekeeping rules. Um, first things first, uh, the election community observes a code of conduct. It is essentially the same code of conduct uh, that is available um, on the repo. And it's also roughly the same code of conduct you would expect from any other organization or community that is not terrible. Um, long story short, if uh, you're at any point uncomfortable, have any troubles, please talk to anyone who has one of those lanyards with a uh, select pad on them, OK? And uh, we will help you out. Um, otherwise, my name is Felix. I work on the desktop app. Uh, I'm one of those people building Slack's desktop app. Um, if any of you also want to work on the Slack desktop app, we have a few uh, people that will be uh, very interested in talking to you, most notably Carl in the back, uh, who can wave right now. Um, so if you feel like you want to work more on Electron, you want to work more on open source, you want to do interesting things, we would love to talk to you. But that said, I think we're just going to jump right in. Um, right here is Abel, who does uh, amazing things with Backtrace. And I think I'm just going to hand it over to him. So thanks. Thanks, Felix. Great. So I was told two things uh, by Felix before preparing this talk. One, uh, I can probably try talking for 30 minutes, but I'll lose the audience at 15. Uh, and two, uh, there's a wide variety of skill levels here. Some folks who may have programmed in native languages like C++ before, some folks who are kind of exclusively JavaScript. Uh, so be wary. Uh, my talk is kind of catered towards those two things. I'll try to go as fast as possible. If I seem like I'm waving my hands a lot, uh, it's because I didn't know how in depth I should go into some of the topics here. Um, but everyone here is using Electron or interested in using Electron. And what I'm here to talk about is with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, and so when you're using something like Electron, uh, it can catastrophically fail on you, uh, such as like a native application crash. And so what actually happens when you see a native application crash? What can you do about it? And actually giving you a glimpse behind the scenes as to what's going on when an application crashes. <clears throat> so I'll start off with a little intro uh, with Electron. Uh, in specific, you know, with Electron, you get some of this niceties of having uh, Node.js available to you in all the processes. You have such things as the rendering processes, the main process, you also have child processes as well. Um, you know, if you're a JavaScript developer, you're probably waving your hands and going, yeah, that's awesome. You know, I can finally build native like applications with kind of exclusively JavaScript and Node.js. Hate to break it to you though, uh, the world isn't as shiny as you think it is. That's because Node.js also contains a lot of C++. Uh, in addition to um, the actual main components of Node.js all being in a native language, things like V8, LibUV. Uh, it also allows you to build what's known as native modules. Uh, these native modules will primarily be in C++, and if you're using Electron, you're actually using quite a bit of native modules as well. Um, so what's the problem when you have something like C++ running alongside JavaScript? Uh, it's because, and I'll talk about this in a bit later, uh, with, again, with great power comes great responsibility. But before I do that, you know, one of the questions a lot of people ask me is, is Hey, C++ is a dead language almost, you know, kind of old. Why do people even use it? All this kind of stuff. Uh, just a little bit of background on me. I'm actually a C++ developer. I've probably been a C++ developer professionally for uh, about eight or nine years. Done that before, even before I was a professional world. Um, and usually C++ is kind of used in CPU and compute bound workloads when you're talking about this type of workload. So why would you introduce C++ into an electron based app? You may want to leverage existing C++ libraries. So you may want to leverage the performance of a video encoding library or a compression library. Uh, and doing this in JavaScript may be prohibitive uh, just based on the performance. Uh, you may want to access resources that are not available via existing JS uh, facilities. Um, so you know things like native notifications, et cetera. Uh, now there are great modules to facilitate this, but you know there has to be some native code that's interacting with the base operating system and functionalities to provide this. 
just a little bit of a, a little fact, over 30% of uh, JS modules are indirectly dependent on native node modules. Uh, and so that stat was actually gathered by the folks that were working on the NAPI stuff. Uh, if you're familiar with the ABI compatibility issues that Node.js has been running into previous to this year. Um, but why native code? Uh, the problem is, is that you're going to deal with a lot of uh, bad things when you're dealing with native code. Uh, probably the biggest issue is that you're running kind of unsupervised. And what I mean by that is you have things such as lack of input sanitation. So um, if you guys have ever heard something called a buffer overflow, you know, you could be doing some sort of string searching. Uh, and if there's not input sanitation, you know, C++, you really have to think about those things. Otherwise, you can blow up the machine. You can get the Windows blue screen of death. You're going to get core dump or something of that nature. Uh, so C++ doesn't save you from these things like JavaScript might. Um, other things you might be dealing with is ABI compatibility. So example of this that I've seen some Electron developers run into is, you know, Node is actually embedded within Electron. So you could be running one version of Node uh, in Electron. And if you're interacting with, let's say, a third party Node process that's not running within Electron, you may be running different versions of Node. There could be an ABI compatibility issue. This is before an API was really introduced. Um, and I'm not going to go over all the various reasons why V8, LibUV can crash, though I see them quite a bit. All right, so you, if you're a JavaScript developer, you're probably saying to yourself, all right, I've dealt with JavaScript exceptions before. You know, I have some notion of creating a JSON object and putting it to a web server. I've got uh, facilities available to me, but what about native code crashes? The problem with native code is that when it crashes, it crashes horrifically. Uh, and what it produces is a binary format uh, file, sorry, a file that's formatted in a binary uh, format known as Minidump. Uh, the Minidump is meant to capture a snapshot of the application. It includes uh, the stack space across all threads. That includes things like, such as registers, module names. All of this is meant to be able to allow a debugger uh, to recreate the state of the process after the fact, aka postmortem analysis. Um, and so this isn't a simple JSON blob that you can get when you throw an exception. Rather, this is a uh, binary file that you have to actually run through the debugging process to symbolificate. And the process of symbolification is where you take this mini dump or you know, other, any other binary asset and actually relate it back to your source code, aka your symbols. Um, you could use various facilities there, you know, Google Breakpad, which is built into Electron, uh, provides a facility known as mini dump walk. Uh, visual code, Visual Studio Code, sorry. Uh, also, you can load in your mini dumps there. Um, however, you can't just simply load in the mini dump file. You require what's known as debug symbols. Um, so before I go on into what debug symbols are and actually how, how this works, and before I see any more glazed eyes, I want to talk a little bit about Electron and how, how it actually produces the mini dump. Um, so here's an awesome diagram I took from a blog. Uh, by, I apologize if I'm butchering the name, Cameron Nakes. Um, but it talks about like the different split between what you want to do within the main process, the rendering process, and what happens between both. I highlighted there something known as the crash reporter. So the crash reporter is responsible within Electron of producing uh, this mini dump. It also provides facilities for you to report the mini dump to uh, some sort of server, aggregation server um, there. So with crash reporter and mini dumps, Crash uh, reporting library uses Breakpad or Crashpad. This is the same crash reporting facility used in things such as Chrome, Firefox. It's also used in other web-like application frameworks. Uh, so CEF, uh, Node WebKit, all of those uh, frameworks use Breakpad slash Crashpad. And Crashpad provides the ability to uh, not only produce a mini dump, but also report the mini dump to uh, uh, an aggregation server, so to speak. I pasted this code snippet from the documentation online. Uh, it's really easy to set up. So if you guys are building an Electron app, definitely recommend you enable Crash Reporter so that you can actually get these mini dumps out. So what happens when a, an application crashes? It produces a mini dump file via Crashpad and Breakpad. And then what's sent along to via Crash uh, Reporter is uh, the mini dump file and via multi-part post uh, submitted a set of attributes. This is called extra parameters in the uh, documentation, where it allows you to characterize the environment in which the crash happened. So what was the version of Electron that was running? Uh, you know, what's the name of the process? So was it renderer? Was it main, et cetera? Going back to the mini dump files and going back to this uh, slide, what are debug symbols? As you see on the right, you need the mini dump file, which we now learned that is produced by something like Breakpad or Crashpad. 
But then you also need the debug symbols uh, to be able to get uh, the human readable call stack. Um, if you're using out of the box compiled Electron framework, you can actually get the debug symbols from uh, both the GitHub hosted debug symbol server, uh, as well as the GitHub releases pages has a listing of all the symbols available as well. I posted some links if you're curious. Um, part of the problem here is if you're dealing with an Electron app and you see a mini dump file, you have to pull in these symbols yourself or you have to configure your debugger to actually uh, retrieve the symbols from the symbol server um, there. Uh, so this could be a strenuous process, especially if you're not sure which version you're running or you have multiple versions running, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is the slide that I probably could talk about for 30 minutes or more, uh, but I won't. Uh, and this is kind of what I do in my day to day, or this is what I did uh, back in the day when I first started Backtrace. So how, does, how do you take this mini dump file, which is actually uh, a binary file that has the set of all threads, and for each thread it has the set of registers as well as the stack space, and actually translate it into symbols, symbols being your source code, your functions, et cetera. Um, well, there's a variety of debug symbol formats. One of the more popular ones is Dwarf. You'll typically use, see this with ELF-linked uh, binaries. That's used on Linux and Unix-based operating systems. For breakpad and crashpad, they typically use what's known as .sim files. And this was something created by the breakpad crashpad team uh, to be a cross-platform debug symbol format. In the .sim file, you'll see various sections. These sections describe um, various components of the native code uh, that your Electron app is running. Uh, what are these kind of records? Uh, what are these components called? Uh, I won't go over all of them, but probably the most important is uh, stack CFI. So the stack CFI uh, will allow you to take this mini dump. Now, remember, the mini dump is a snapshot of the application. And so kind of near the top of the uh, mini dump file, it will have a memory address. This memory address is the virtualized address of what was executing at the time that the mini dump was taken. Uh, this address now maps to um, some, some form of a call stack, so to speak. Uh, when I say some form, what I mean by that is um, it, uh, the call stack or the uh, section within um, the call stack that you're located, the way you describe that is by the frame, the function name. You also describe that by the set of registers there. And so the process of actually symbolificating is taking the current state of the application with the set of registers and the uh, memory address uh, where the current uh, instruction is executing and actually backing out of it. Uh, this is, think of it like a finite state machine if you've ever done kind of like electrical engineering or computer engineering. So what you're doing is, is you're running through the finite state machine described by uh, the .sim file uh, to take the set of registers and actually back out what the registers used to look like before the top level function was called. Once you get to that point, you recursively go down to the next function. So you now go to frame to N1, you're using the stack CFI, which to execute a finite state machine to back out the register information, and then you kind of recursively do that again and again. Um, once you back out the set of registers to what they look like when uh, the function was called, then you have enough information to be able to map that to function names, source line information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right, so this is all I'm gonna talk about here. If you're interested in this topic, then there's a really good GitHub page by the Google team on the .sim format. If you wanna talk about Dwarf and Elf, more than happy to talk about that as well. Um, that's kind of where I've spent most of my headspace for at least two or three years um, there. So why, why does this even matter to Electron, et cetera? Well, Electron apps actually produce mini dumps. Um, however, dealing with debug symbols, running it through visual code, you know, it just doesn't work if you, your Electron app gets wildly popular. And that's because you want to be able to see the call stacks across potentially tens of thousands of crashes out there. And so what we did at Backtrace is we built this server that actually receives mini dump files. It automatically retrieves debug symbols from things like Firefox, the Electron symbol server, Microsoft symbol servers, and then it produces human readable call stacks. So think of it like a debugger, but server side, where you can submit uh, your crash reporter items and then actually get a call stack out of it. Um, great. So the last point that I wanted to take, and actually one of the main reasons I was talking uh, here, was that one of the things that we want to do at Backtrace is actually provide Backtrace for free to the Electron maintainers. And so we have a server out there, electron.sp.backtrace.io. Uh, I'll figure out how to post this information. But if you're developing an Electron app, and you probably don't know what to do with your mini dump files, this could be incredibly useful to the Electron maintainer team. 
the guys that are working on the native code, et cetera. And so we're going to provide free uh, access to that. And so you can report your native crashes to the Electron server, and then they can go off and fix and actually make the Electron framework even more robust for you all making Electron apps. Cool? All right. I don't know if I have time for questions, but that was at least 15 minutes. So. OK, awesome. Yeah. So typically, it's uh, encrypted via HTTPS. So you'll at least get that level of encryption. Um, there are other. There are other forms of both compression and uh, encryption you can provide. There are no APIs provided by Electron out of the box that allow you to do that. Yep. Yeah, so folks use Backtrace as well for native modules. The problem is, is that they'll need a simple server uh, spooled up, or they can use Backtrace as the simple server. So if you compile a native module, let's say with node git or et cetera, then you can upload your debug symbols to backtrace, and then you'll get the symbolicated call stacks as well. So if in your build process, um, the, uh, the debug symbols that are produced, uh, they could be in .dsim, they could be in .pdb, they can be in uh, the kind of normal dwarf format. Those can be kind of, you can automatically upload those via an HTTP API. So there's not necessarily tooling, but you can just use curl in your build process. Then uh, I would say, here, here's my contact information. <laughs> Twitter account, feel free to send me a message. More than happy to do that. So the, the team behind CrashPad and BreakPad is the same team uh, that was working on a subset of Chrome uh, back in the day. They also used BreakPad for a number of other things at Google. So they're really smart about how they built BreakPad and then the successor with CrashPad. So first and foremost, going back to uh, this, uh, the mini dump file is serialized to disk. And that's a best attempt effort. It's not guaranteed that you're actually going to be able to write the full mini dump. It's not guaranteed that the mini dump itself will be fully um, how do I say this uh, in the correct state? But uh, from my experience, 99% of the time, it's the case that at least the mini dump file is serialized. The process behind submitting that to a server, let's say, is asynchronous. So it can happen after the fact. And so the way, um, actually one of the biggest things with CrashPad and why that was produced after BreakPad was this kind of out of process mission mechanism. So if you, if you look through the Electron documentation, if you look through the source code, there's something known as crash uploader. Um, or crash reporter, and that's part of crash pad, where it's a completely separate out of process mechanism to upload the mini dump uh, instead of being within process. Because you're correct, if you have a native code crash, um, various operating system mechanisms will limit your ability to do things. So on Linux, for example, you can't allocate memory, you can't do re entrant or you can't do non re entrant things when you're in a crash context. Uh, so, for example, in a signal handler, you do very, very bad things will happen to your program. So to answer your question shortly, yeah, things could really get messed up, but <laughs> they've, they've engineered it in such a way that a lot of the times it's not. All right, awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> ben. Uh, next up, we have Ben, who I think some of you may have seen before. Um, mostly because Ben has been in the Viking community for a while. He's spoken at the meetup before. Uh, Used to, used to, you know, work at Nihilus. Um, he's been doing awesome things with Electron for a while now. And uh, dongle. We do have a dongle. Um, how about everybody grab a drink while we dongle things up? Yeah. I have a snazzy new computer, but no dongles. Uh, is this going to do? I don't think so. I need the USB. Oh, you're going to use the C USB. only. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'll hit you up in a second. Oh wait, but then this, oh, it's at the end. Well, wow, this is sneaky. This is like, got, got everything on here. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, I think you can probably use the same one. It's the same computer. Yeah, I will figure it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, let me just turn off mirror. How long is your talk? Um, it's probably going to be like half an hour, but okay. I can try and make it. Uh, Should it be longer take, than no, that? Or? Just take another break. Like, don't start yet. I'm going to find try to find another adapter because one of the Bible ones. Oh, okay. Nice. That actually worked. All right. Okay, I think Felix wanted to uh, wanted to swap this USB C adapter out for a different one uh, so that you can take off, but uh, well, I'll just dive right in. If we need to swap uh, projector, we'll just drop for a second. Um, cool. So yeah, as, as Felix mentioned, uh, my name is Ben Goto. Um, I've been kind of around the Electron community for a while. Um, from 2014 to 2016, I, I led the team uh, at a startup here in town called Nihilus um, that built a mail client called Nihilus Mail. Um, I originally kind of got my start building uh, I, native iOS apps. Um, back when you could be like an independent iOS app developer and, and like, actually make money. Um, and now I run a, a small team doing React and mobile development uh, and work on another mail client, uh, which is based on Nihilus Mail called Mailspring. Um, so before we dive in, um, a lot of you guys have heard about Nihilus Mail because I've, I've talked about it at Electron meetups before. Um, we've done some cool stuff with it. Uh, so what, what happened exactly? <laughs> Uh, so, Nihilus has always had kind of two primary businesses. Uh, one of them was selling uh, their API services as kind of a B2B product. Um, they build a set of APIs that's kind of like Twilio for email, um, where you can have your customers go through OAuth and like then make REST API calls to like figure out what's in their inbox. Um, and that business over the last like year has just like exploded. Um, and so in May of this year, they kind of pulled all of the people that were working on Nihilus Mail to focus on uh, fighting fires on their API. Uh, and in September, uh, I guess like two months ago, uh, Nihilus Mail was officially sunset and they relicensed everything under MIT. Um, and this was actually like, it, you know, the company's doing great, it's been really fun, but uh, this was a little bit sad for me because I have been working on Nihilus Mail for a really long time. Um, and I, I left Nihilus and uh, am continuing work on Nihilus Mail under a new name, which is called Mailspring, um, with the goal of fixing some of the longstanding issues and using the revenue from the pro version to essentially like run the service and you know, put bounties on bugs that people really want fixed and kind of like maintain the open source project. Um, so if you've never seen Nihilus Mail, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's kind of blown out here on this, this big display. But um, so what I wanted to talk about today are some of the things that I've been working on to sort of those long-standing issues I was talking about. Um, why, don't swap you, it out. Why, why don't you just keep talking? I'll just okay. quickly hot swap. <laughs> cool. Um, and so I think that a lot of the stuff uh, applies to Electron apps in general that we're going to talk about. Um, and for those of you that are kind of new to Electron, um, there are some tips in here that you can use to sort of keep yourself sane when you're working on your, your first Electron app. Um, so what were, the, what were the big complaints? Uh, <laughs> so this, this is sort of, this started as a slide about Nihilus Mail and ended as a slide about like Electron in general, I guess. Um, so the things we hear a lot about, uh, you know, everybody raving on Hacker News about, et cetera, et cetera, um, are the long startup time of Electron apps, uh, the high battery impact. People complain about like, you know, oh, it like killed my MacBook Pro like all the time. Um, and using too much RAM. And I, I put a little asterisk next to this last one because you hear people about complaining about the RAM usage of Electron apps all the time. Um, and it is a significant issue, but with things like RAM compression and like paging to disk based on the you know, foreground processes and stuff on your Mac, 
um, you know, you, you have a lot of RAM in your computer. And a lot of, <laughs> and like an SSD, like, like RAM usage is actually not a very big deal. But people care about it a lot, and so we're going to fix it. Um, and so rather than, you know, kind of getting caught up in all the vitriol, uh, we're just going to put on our little construction hats and try and fix this stuff. Um, and so the first thing that, uh, you know, is, is kind of an obvious mark of like a, you know, V1 Electron app is that it takes forever to start. Um, you know, you click the little dock icon, and it's like sitting there bouncing and like four seconds go by. Um, in the early versions of Nihilus Mail, we actually had like a loading, like a splash screen. Um, and I was always like really sad about that. Um, but so when I sort of forked Nihilus Mail and started working on MailSpring, I was like, okay, I want this thing to start so fast people don't know it's an Electron app. Um, and so there are a couple things you can do right off the bat. Um, one trick is to start loading a browser window as quickly as you can. Um, you know, usually with the way Electron apps are bootstrapped, uh, you kind of have this like main.js file that runs uh, in the main process, and then that essentially like uses the Electron APIs to create a window, which then runs more Node.js JavaScripts like in your window. Um, so you want to start that process like as quickly as you can. Um, the other thing to watch out for is doing synchronous I.O. in the main process. You know, if you need to like read your preferences or like check whether some desktop shortcut has been created, um, you know, doing as much of that asynchronously as you can is a good idea. Um, one thing I noticed is that, uh, you know, I have like a nice MacBook Pro with an SSD in it. Uh, people with like old school hard drives really, really have a rough time. Um, the other thing I, I just figured, I think this is pretty much uh, on by default now, as long as you use like Electron Forge or Electron Packager to, to bundle up your application. Um, but you should always be using the ASAR format in production. It essentially is it's sort of like a RAM disk. It essentially takes all of the JavaScript of your app and packs it all into one giant like 40 megabyte file. Um, it's essentially just all of the files concatenated together back to back. And, and um, it's really great on Windows because it takes a long time to like open file handles and stuff. So you only have to open one file handle, and then you can read all of the JavaScript files. Um, but the biggest thing that you know I found after trying to reduce startup time, trying to reduce startup time, is just to load less JavaScript, uh, which is sort of I don't know if that's like a solution or if it's just <laughs> the state of the art. But uh, but let's let's look at that a little bit. So this is like a typical Electron app. <laughs> Where you have your code up here, and maybe you, you know, maybe you wrote like 30,000 lines of JavaScript or something, and you're like, oh my god, this is huge. Um, under the hood, node modules get crazy, uh, and you you might not even be aware of like how crazy. Um, so one great example is I found this. I I've been like I have a new hobby of like filing issues with random people's repos uh, about their bundle sizes and stuff. Um, so this this node module just checks whether the interconnection, internet connection is up. Um, and you'd expect, like, OK, this is going to be like one of those tiny little things. It's probably like index.js, 10 lines of code, boom. Um, it turns out this thing requires something called is reachable, which also sounds innocuous. Um, is reachable requires something called port numbers, which also sounds innocuous. And port numbers requires, uh, in its index file, immediately goes and requires some JSON files. And those JSON files are 1.7 megabytes of just like static stuff. And this is like, I, I haven't even asked it any questions yet. Like I don't, I don't care whether it's online or not. Um, and so this stuff is kind of frustrating. This has been fixed actually, because um, I wrote them a nice, I basically sent them a PR moving this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so one trick you can use right off the bat is not requiring things in global scope. Um, you know, if you're using ES6, it wants all your imports at the top, and, and typically that's like a great idea. Um, unless you know that something that you're importing you don't need very often and is like 1.7 megabytes of JSON. Um, so one really great tool that you can use to find these things, because um, otherwise, you know, what are you going to do, like scan like thousands and thousands of node modules? Um, there's this uh, DevTools extension called DevTron which uh, is easy to install and use in your Electron app. It, it adds a new tab to the inspector. Um, 
And you can see like right up at the top in the tab name that I've got like 12 and a half megabytes of JavaScript loaded. Um, and the thing is like you can try and make your code as fast as you possibly can, but like it's just gonna take a while to load 12 and a half megabytes of JavaScript and like parse it all and like convert it into V8's like intermediate format or whatever. Um, and so this is kind of like something you, you just have to have to face eventually. Um, another really good tip that I, I was shocked actually, um, if you're coming from the Node world and you're writing an Electron app, uh, there are a lot of libraries that you use in Node that are just kind of like de facto, like, you know, I start a new Node project and I immediately add like the request module because it has like a really nice interface for you know, making HTTP requests. Um, it turns out the request module has and it is just an enormous amount of JavaScript, and it, it actually re-implements cookies um, because there are there's no like in Node there's no concept of cookies, um, but they wanted to you know have this nice interface where you could like make one request and add cookies and yeah. Wow, that's that's another good one. I, I should I'm gonna yeah, that's crazy. Um, okay, so. So there's a lot of stuff hiding in these things that you don't necessarily care about when you're writing server software. Like I don't, I don't care if my backend service takes like 100 milliseconds to launch or like a second and a half. Um, but you know, for a lot of purposes, you know, in Chromium you can use the new fetch APIs, which are available. Um, you know, Bluebird is a, a really nice promise library, but in the last like two releases of Chromium, they've actually built almost all of that stuff into the native promise implementation. Um, and so there's some stuff you can do to kind of just like thin things out. And uh, I spent a while banging on this in the Nihilus Mail app and got it down to rough, a little bit less than half, uh, like five and a half megabytes of JavaScript, um, which still takes about a second to load, but like isn't, isn't crazy. Um, and then the last thing about performance is, you know, there, there's some things you can't, you can't avoid loading. Like, you know, I need this like spell checker library that Paul Betts wrote. And it's going to go off and do all this stuff. Um, but who needs spell check in like the first 500 milliseconds of a window being open? Right? Like you just can't type that much. Like you, don't, you won't notice if there's no spell check. Um, and so another thing you can do is like load the, the core stuff you need for the window. And then like just throw a set timeout in there and like wait a while. And then go and load like a bunch of UI plugins or you know, start the spell checker a second later. Um, so that the time to interactive is as short as you can possibly make it. Um, cool. So that's a little bit about trying to improve the performance. Uh, at the end of the day, I got Nihilus Mail like right to one second to interactive, and uh, and I think that's that's like doing pretty good. But we'll see. Always always room for improvement. Yeah, Paul. That's true. Better than set timeout. Yeah, yeah, request idle callback. If you haven't like Googled that yet, uh, it's a new feature they added in Chromium like two or three releases ago now, and um, it's, it's pretty great. Uh, basically lets you say like, wait until I'm not busy and then do something. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about, so I was working on all this stuff a couple months ago and I got this shiny new MacBook Pro and it was so fast and beautiful and it kind of broke my heart though because the battery life on this thing is just so bad. Um, this, this press photo like kind of isn't accurate. Uh, usually for me, it looks like this. Um, and so the other thing that I kind of wanted to look at in trying to make this MailSpring app as performant as possible was the energy impact. Um, and so like, just to give you an example of kind of how bad this started, uh, if you launched Nihilus Mail and it was done syncing all of your mail, it's just sitting there, uh, and you hit it in the background and waited 15 minutes, uh, it still used this much, it still had like a really bad uh, energy impact score. Um, and so this is something that they've kind of made up recent, in recent versions of Mac OS X. It's a combination of sort of like CPU usage and like idle wakes, which is how often the process uh, does something that needs the CPU to spin up. Um, because they're essentially like, side note, they're, they're kind of like turning the MacBook Pro into a big iPad. and. Uh, you know, the thing like powers down all the CPUs when you're not doing anything and it's, it's kind of crazy, but this is really bad. Um, so what can we do to reduce energy impact? Um, 
the number one thing you can do in your applications is to check for animations that are running and like needless layout. Um, the second thing is minimizing use of set timeout and set interval. Um, you know, I know we had a lot of places where we we're sort of getting lazy and we we're like, okay, like just do this like every half an hour or, you know, ping our servers like every 10 minutes, um, which on, on, you know, if that's the only place in your application you're doing it, that's not terrible. But if you start writing like a bunch of those, uh, things start to get kind of ugly. Um, the other thing that I think is a really nice trick is attaching an event listener to like the window focus events and basically creating a CSS class that just like stops all animations and transitions and everything when the app is backgrounded. Um, if you guys follow the Electron community, you probably saw this uh, back in March. Um, there was this like really hilarious sort of embarrassing bug in uh, VS Code where it would use like 11% of your CPU just flashing the text insertion point. Um, and so this, this kind of ties back into that first bullet point, which is looking for kind of rogue animations that are still running. Um, and it's super easy to do, so you should all, all do this. Um, if you open the developer tools panel and kind of pull open the console, there's a, like a tab in the console and there's some paint like rendering options you can enable. And one of them is paint flashing. And you can essentially say like, just show me the areas of the screen that Chrome is repainting. Um, and so this, I actually just caught this uh, in MailSpring like two days ago, where like this screen has like this cool loading indicator that like plays this animation. And the loading panel, the loading like cover had disappeared, but the loading indicator was actually still animating, even though it was like 0% opaque. Um, and so this is the kind of stuff where like, you might not notice it, it might get out to users, but if somebody actually tried to run this and sat on this screen, like their MacBook Pro would be dead in three hours, um, which is kind of a bummer. And uh, so for fixing the like set timeout and set interval stuff, um, I've, I've had a lot of luck using smarter polling strategies, you know, looking at places where you're setting an interval and being like, okay, what if we change the frequency that this happened based on like the electron power monitor API and said, okay, if, you're, if the thing is like plugged into AC, let's sync your mail like every 30 seconds, why not? And if you're you know, running on battery and you have like 15% battery left, like let's do it every five minutes. Um, you know, it's, it's the kind of stuff that like users probably won't notice, but is, is super nice. Um, the other thing I, I uh, have also switched out a lot of places where it was polling to say, why don't we wait until the window is foregrounded and like when we get that focus event, then we'll go refresh some stuff or like, you know, check to see if your user account is still active on our server or something like that. Um, I, that's actually a really good question. I don't, I think that the power monitor API is, is event based. Uh, I think it listens for like events coming from the underlying system and just like throws them up in the JavaScript. So I don't think that it's expensive, but we should check. It would be really hilarious if I made these changes and it turns out it was just pulling further down. Uh, it's like pulling, pulling all the way down sometimes. Um, so uh, with the Nihilus mail code base, um, chain, like trying to improve all this stuff and turn it into MailSpring, um, I made all these changes, but it sort of wasn't enough. Um, it, it, like I, I was still not able to like leave this mail client running all day long and use my computer to coffee shop. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, like it needs to sync mail every couple minutes. Um, syncing mail is hard. It involves keeping connections open to like IMAP and SMTP servers, uh, and also keeping like a streaming connection open to uh, the, the services backend for read receipts and stuff like that. Um, and you know, there's just not a whole lot you can do about some of those requirements. Um, and so, kind of revisited the architecture of this app. And you may have seen me talk about this in the past. Uh, if not, the way that a lot of Electron apps are structured, uh, there's like a browser window that's your, your UI. Um, you know, it has like your big list view and all your scroll view and you know, everything that you might be doing. Um, and there's a separate browser window that's created or maybe like a couple browser windows that are created to actually do kind of event processing and talk to your server and like do the heavy lifting of whatever your app does. Um, and this way, you know, 
you can be downloading 17 megabytes of JSON and the user can be scrolling at the same time and like it's all buttery smooth. Um, and so Nihilus Mail was built on this kind of architecture and we basically had an event bus where stuff could be processed in this worker window and shuttled back to the main window. Um, and so the stuff on the left in this picture is perfect for Electron. Um, it's all CSS, so the app is themable. You know, it's really easy to write plugins because it uses React. Um, and you, know, you can write features really fast. But the stuff on the right, the actual like, email syncing bit, um, it's a lot of like, string processing and downloading like, an array of 400,000 UNT32s from the server and comparing that to 400,000 UNT32s on disk. Um, and you, know, you can do all this stuff really efficiently in JavaScript. I could go like, use array buffer and, and all that stuff, but you know, at the end of the day, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's not worth it. So what I did uh, for MailSpring is I basically ripped out the entire like, email processing part of the app. Um, all of the email sync and search indexing and message processing, the holding connections open to our server, just got rid of all of it um, and replaced it with a little C++ application. Um, so C++, this, is actually, this actually turned out to be not as much of a mess as I thought, uh, which is kind of, kind of nice. Um, a command line C++ process replaced the background worker window. Um, it reads things you want it to do on standard in, in JSON format, and it writes, you know, change events essentially saying like, hey, I wrote this to the database. Hey, I changed this thread. Hey, I, you know, downloaded these messages. Um, writes all that stuff to standard out. Uh, the main window of the Electron app spawns these processes, like binds to the standard I.O. streams, and basically just like pretends that the events coming from the C++ app are its own events and kind of sends them around the application like it used to. Um, and you know, this actually turned out to be kind of nice because if you just use standard in and standard out, uh, you can test the C++ part in isolation um, and just like run it from the Xcode command line. Um, you know, there were some trade-offs of doing this. Uh, one of the things I think is really interesting is that in JavaScript, uh, control flow is really hard. Um, you know, you have promises and async await and all these APIs. Async await is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, but you still have to think about everything being asynchronous. Um, in C++, the, the control flow is really easy, but memory management is hard. Um, you know, they, everything's synchronous. Like, you just spawn a thread and then you, like, make requests to your API server, like, synchronously, which is super weird. Um, but, you know, these are, memory management is, like, getting easier. Uh, and the SQLite bindings for C++ are unbelievably fast compared to like Node SQLite. Um, but shipping C++ cross-platform is hard. I will maybe write a separate talk about that at some point. Uh, it turns out that if you want to ship C++ code to Windows, you need to like bundle a bunch of DLLs with it or people get very upset. Um, and the other thing, I, the other thing, you know, I, I don't want to dive into like C++ too much because I know this is JavaScript meetup and like, we don't, we don't mix that often, uh, but C++ is actually kind of pretty. Like, I don't know when, the, if you guys have looked at C++ recently, um, but like I hadn't. I, I like studied C++ in school like nine years ago and haven't looked back. Um, they have like shorthands for types now. So you can say like auto plugin ID and the compiler like blasts the, you know, 30 characters worth of like template types in there. Um, if they have like this fast iteration model where you can say like 4m colon array, which is super cool. Um, and there's like a JSON light, like this is like basically building a JSON block right here. Um, it actually like is kind of nice. And, uh, and the results were kind of nice too. So this is sort of the before screenshot that I showed of, you know, the electron mail client sitting there in the background, not doing anything but syncing your mail. Um, and this is the new mail client doing the exact same thing, sitting in the background um, and using a dramatically smaller amount of, of energy doing it. Um, and the same thing kind of goes for, uh, for memory use. Because I essentially like, got rid of one half of the Electron app uh, that was sitting there with a browser window, like doing tons and tons of stuff, um, it essentially cut the RAM usage of the app in half, um, which doesn't actually matter that much, but people 
love it, so they can, they can have less memory. Um, so just some quick takeaways. Uh, don't want to keep this going too long. Uh, keep your dependencies light. Uh, use built-in APIs whenever you can. Uh, for most purposes, things like the new uh, Fetch API that's built into Chromium are enough. Um, and use the DevTron tool that's available from, for Electron to check your require tree. Um, use paint flashing. It's, it's super awesome, and you can catch like crazy animations that you're doing and not noticing. Um, make sure that you're not like relayouting the text cursor over and over again. Uh, and finally, you know, if it makes sense for the job, you know, as I think the, the previous presentation noted, like if you're doing a lot of really intensive processing, or you know, you need to like idle in the background at basically like zero percent CPU. Um, using C plus plus or you know the the wagon guys that built a whole SQLite tool, we're using Haskell. Um, it's actually not that crazy to couple Electron as the UI with something else underneath. Um, cool. So uh, my name is Ben Goto. You can find me on Twitter, and uh, this is the website for the new version of the mail client uh, that I'm continuing to maintain. And uh, if we have time for questions, are we good? How are we, how are we looking, Felix? OK. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Thanks, Felix. Oh, man, I don't know. Um, yeah, so AppNap, basically, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think the basic idea is that um, if, if you notify Mac OS X that your app is scheduling timers but like doesn't care that much about them, um, you can essentially let the operating system move the timers that you've created. So what it'll do is like, you know, take, it'll, it'll be sitting there with like the CPU completely off and it'll wake the computer and run the timers for all of the processes and then shut back down. Um, so it kind of like clusters work that it has to do together. Um, like pretty much like iOS. Like they're getting, they're making the battery smaller and smaller and getting more and more out of it. But that's, you know, actually I didn't even notice that. That's a really good question. Um, I will have to look at that. It probably is because the C++, I'm, I must not be setting some flag somewhere saying like, feel free to mess with these timeout values, essentially. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Yep, so um, essentially what happens is the, the C++ app it has a rewrite connection to the SQLite database. Um, and it like writes all the mail in there and reads stuff out to sync. Um, the front end application actually only has a read connection to the database. And all of the writes kind of get funneled through the C++ app. Um, I sort of did that so that I wouldn't have to write the like validation code and constraints and everything in both places. Um, but yeah, it's essentially like a, C a SQLite database and then a set of kind of before save and after save hooks, so to speak, that ensure that like all of those changes broadcast events. Um, so like when you go to put something in the database, it like sends a copy of the object to the other processes and says, hey, like I'm about to save this. You know, refresh anything that's using this object. Cool. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Awesome. Well, good stuff, guys. Oh, yeah, one more. I think, um, yeah, so web workers, I actually don't know what the latest is on web workers and Electron. Uh, it's a little. It's a little hairy. Uh, this, web workers are a really great uh, set of APIs for Chromium. Um, but in Electron, you, you can only make like limited use of the node APIs from web workers. Um, I'm not sure that you can like open access to the file system or something like that from a web worker. Um, maybe you can now. I'm not sure. But I think um, in this case, a lot of the gains coming from doing the C++ stuff uh, we're really about having lower level data structures and kind of like richer access to things like SQLite and you know, being able to do like SQLite prepared statements and keep them around and stuff like that. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah.
good stuff. Okay, cool. I think we should take another five minute bio break for everyone who needs it and also grab more pizza because I think there's still a ton left. And after that five minute break, um, at like 15, we're going to have Max from Realm talk about, you know, Realm and Electron. Um, so stay tuned for that. So, make that should be pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I will. I will like. I will like corral people back together so you don't have to do that. No, like a timer. Uh, okay. Oh, you mean for the total for the total talk? Yeah. You're pretty much whatever you need. Like it's not. Trust me, as long as you don't go over thirty, I'm cool. I cut my presentation in half. Oh. <laughs> I like looked at the email and like yeah. Thirty minutes. Yeah, I mean most people we saw the two other presentations, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. yeah. Um, so I saved I saved some of the cool stuff. Cool. So you have content for like a month. You gotta keep it interested, you know? Gotta keep it yeah, can't can't just show them everything. So do you work at Slack? Yeah. Nice.
Paging. Oh no. Who's that mean? Cool. Paging everyone. Paging everyone. Please sit back down or the program will continue. I think there's no point <laughs> telling people what's on the slide. All right, cool. Well, Hi, I'm Max Alexander. I'm from uh, Realm. I am a product engineer over there, and that means I get to wear a whole bunch of different hats. Uh, who here has heard of Realm at all? Whoa! Are you guys mobile engineers here? Yeah? No? That's, that's pretty amazing. So who here has used Realm on iOS? Hey, okay. Android? Nice. And Realm.js? How do, how do you hear about Realm? Wow, my God, we must be spamming you. Um, cool, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, building offline first apps uh, with real-time functionality uh, and putting them into Electron. So, uh, so we believe at Realm that good native apps don't really feel like web apps. Even if you built an iOS app or an Android app from the ground up using either Swift or Android, very low-level languages, uh, if you have, um, we still think that you probably should show your users data. People have very low attention spans, and they if you see a loading indicator, there's a really good chance you might lose them. And we have a lot of data to back that up, and people pay a lot of money to avoid uh, showing empty screens, especially e-commerce apps or social media apps, anything that needs a lot of attention given to it. Right? So uh, this is one thing we keep on showing to a lot of presentations. Like native apps rarely show this. You can't avoid it, but try to show this as less as possible. Um, there's a lot of times when your app is firing up for the first time, internet connection hasn't been uh, granted, maybe the, the network is spotty, but you still want them to feel like they're in, in an app that has some data. Okay, so you respect your user's experience and show data fast. Okay, it might be out of date, it might be stale, but show them something. Um, we traditionally have called this. Uh, UI caching or something like that, have you, and you realize how hard it is uh, to keep your code pretty sane with UI caching. Cool. So uh, enter Realm. We are an in, in incredibly fast C++ database uh, designed specifically for UIs. Now we're on the server as well, but uh, we have high considerations for user experience and uh, binding to UI uh, elements and components as well. So. We have uh, 3.5 billion downloads, uh, primarily from Android and iOS, but we also have bindings for C Sharp, .NET, uh, with our server side coming out very soon for .NET. Um, uh, full support for Kotlin at the office right now. We're actually hosting KotlinConf. Um, and then also uh, Node.js, which is our server side language as well, our uh, premier server side language with React Native. So we don't run on the browser yet. So uh, because it's a C++ uh, core with language-specific bindings for each. 
Um, so that kind of brought Realm to a position where we had constant uh, feedback saying like, hey, we can't, uh, we want to use Realm, we want to use Realm, but when are you guys going to have a, um, like a, a front end browser experience? When are, when are we going to be able to use this with Angular or React? Um, we are on the works of that, but I discovered by accident that <laughs> our bindings work actually with Electron. And this has helped the company uh, immensely. We have uh, a few UI uh, projects that have been written in OSX, and uh, we could not port that over. A lot of our Android developers are actually on Windows, so we haven't been able to cater to any of them. Uh, with Electron, and we discovered that Realm works very nicely with Electron, uh, we could have one or uh, two engineers work on a full database, full stack platform that allows them to be cross-platform, which is one of the promises of Electron, and it's really worked out uh, with minimal uh, of friction as well. So some of the companies that are using Realm right now, and they're pretty excited to get onto the Electron uh, um, findings as well. Um, so you have Amazon, Google, Starbucks, Hitmonk, VC. So we're trusted by a lot of different companies, so we hope that we're stable enough for your next project. All right. So this is Realm.js. Uh, it's pretty easy to install. It's npm install Realm. Uh, in Electron, let's be considerate uh, at its current state. You probably need Electron Builder to help it build for your specific um, architecture as well. So the first time you install Realm, it's going to be a little slow because it's pulling down uh, specific bindings for your architecture, as well as probably building some native dependencies as well. Um, we're hoping to improve on that, so uh, don't get discouraged. Cool. So from a top down, uh, Realm is a tabular database. We have uh, support for relationships. We are C++ based, but we have your native language bindings. And it's, very, it's a B tree, B plus tree design. And we have strict schemas. So it's not a mixed database. It's not a JSON based database. But uh, we do really like schemas and we like to keep your data very, very nice and organized. Um, yep. So in Realm.js, this is how you would define a schema. Uh, right now, it is simply purely a object literal. Uh, you can define some properties on them, uh, specifying what the JSON would look like. So here's a good example of a product. And you have three properties, specifying what the C++, our native, um, uh, our native type uh, in a string format, which is a literal. You can have indexes, primary keys. I don't need to bog you down with that. You can look at our docs for all that information. And when you want to open up a Realm, a Realm is a database. And all you have to do is specify the schema. Uh, schemas are additive. So you can have different instances of the schemas um, with uh, properties that are missing in one or another. But if you add schemas together, uh, they'll be merged. And all the tables will be there. And you'll have your instance to your database uh, by synchronously constructing it. Uh, so once you've gotten your Realm, you, uh, after, after you've com uh, committed to your schema, you can specify the type of product or the, uh, sorry, you can specify the type of object that you want to uh, put in or read from. And here's an example of creating a product. And you put in basically a JSON literal of what the data you want in. And this true over here will be an upsert. Really good for applications that map to JSON. Like you probably will get JSON, you don't have to do a full check every single time, and it will discover uh, whether or not the data is in there and then return to you the actual instance. Cool. So, uh, this is an example of reading from uh, a realm. You can specify this is with TypeScript. Uh, I, I hear a lot of guys here really like TypeScript, so I wanted to really emphasize our, our ability to have generics. You, uh, there's a little bit of redundancy over there, but we're working to improve on that. Here's an example of getting products, and I only want the prices which are lower than $25. This is pretty interesting. This is not an array of products. This is a special realm collection. A realm collection is a pointer to all the uh, data that would be in this collection set. Um, and we'll see in a few demo examples why that's kind of important. Here's a good example of sorting. It's pretty simple. You can see that uh, our language APIs are uh, chainable. We have optionals for using price uh, to do true or false for ascending or descending. All right, so uh, this is a demo. 
uh, of realm working on electron. So uh, who here is familiar with React? You don't need React. You don't need use view. You don't need really any uh, front end framework. But it works very, very nicely with virtualized uh, uh, frameworks as well. So virtualized frameworks are uh, frameworks that basically don't really add to the DOM just yet. They are an abstraction layer on top of it. And they allow for UIs to be uh, kind of piped in with data and piped out with data. So you don't construct DOM the entire time and slow down the application. Cool. So this is an app. Um, I'll go from the top bottom. We have some uh, utilities. React Data Grid is the virtualized uh, UI that we're going to use to show a table uh, that can show a lot of data and a massive amount without having a lot of frame rate drops. Uh, so here, we've just defined a schema. I'm using TypeScript. So for you people who like TypeScript, we ship with the def uh, definition packages right in our uh, NPM module. Now we create a realm. You can call this realm any object. And uh, I've already pre-bootstrapped a lot of objects here. This is very, very fast. We're going to put a million different products using Faker. Raise your hand if I'm going a little too fast. Good? Good speed? Cool. All right. Um, and good, good size, everyone can see in the back? Cool. All right. And so we've created a million products here. And in this React component, um, we're just going to define uh, what this table will look like with uh, React Data Grid. And uh, we are going to bind uh, React Data Grid to a component. And the great thing about React Data Grid, like React Virtualize or other virtualized frameworks, um, and components, what it allows us to do is as you move a grid for a scrollable element, um, it will detect which elements or indexes are important and dequeue them from uh, your data, data set. The great thing about Realm is here's a million objects, so it's quite a lot of objects in there. What Realm allows you to do is have a collection and ask the collection for objects lazily. So this allows your application to uh, react pretty uh, smooth and buttery, right? So we're going to check out this app. Oh, before I go on, this was pretty uh, explanatory, right? This was it's pretty clear what we're doing. All right, so it's going to compile. Uh, and now we have a million products. And as you can see, it's pretty fast. It's not slowing down. and we are going straight into the memory mapped C++ data, which is on disk, memory mapped to uh, Realm objects. And we are just going right through them and scrolling over a million products. It's quite fast in performance, so it's really, really good for applications that really need to show a ton of data, uh, but only in segmented chunks. So the great part of this is as objects are unused for a long time, we have a render cycle in the back that uh, deallocates them from memory. So the objects that have been up at the top, they're no longer uh, part of the memory. So it uh, allows your application to breathe as you move. Cool. Awesome. So um, that's not so much of the reason why I met Realm. I joined Realm because it was a reactive database. I mean, that's the big thing these days. Yeah. Here is uh, the same sort of example. And with a timer, I'm going to uh, go through with uh, an upsert every single object in here with some new data. And I'm going to do it every single 200 milliseconds. So every single 200 milliseconds, we can add a listener to the object. So one of the best parts of this listener is this is a realm, a realm results collection. And you can filter them, rechain them, and uh, see what objects move in and out of the scope. So for example, you could have a ticker and a ticker of prices. And as prices change, I only want to observe, say, prices that are under 25, right? And as products move in and out of there, uh, they'll be removed from the collection. And you don't have to do anything but bind to the, uh, bind to the data set. So this is great. What the best part is I made a count of which objects are in that result set. So here's 1,000. There are objects moving in and out of that query of 25. And this is a great example of 
having my UI be completely uh, untied to the logic of the query set. The query is a, a, a living object in of its own. Cool? Did I go a little too fast? Wow, everyone's heads up. Everyone's so smart. This is great. Cool. Um, so this is really, really uh, fun for writing an application that is super reactive and keeping React kind of uh, out of managing state. As you've probably seen, I did not actually do anything much with state. I'm only just using set state as a way to tell React to uh, re-render. You can use force update if you'd like. But um, the idea was I had the products right here. This is something I'm not polling for. The uh, database in and of itself understands your query and pipes up those changes and mutates the object. They're live objects. You can also get snapshots of them so you don't see them change under your feet. Um, that always scares some people. Cool. And um, we've created a React app. This is uh, an early product called, um, called uh, Realm Studio. This is our Excel uh, Postico sort of client that you use for uh, observing realms. So the best part of Realm right now is we've created, which the team I'm on is the Realm Object Server. The Realm Object Server is a very complex uh, operational transform server that takes a, look at, uh, takes a look at two realms or more, or like a whole bunch, and then does conflict resolution using operational transform. Have you guys heard of operational transform at all? So it's uh, a great uh, algorithm for writing collaborative applications. We've done it at the database level so that uh, when applications are offline, Say, for example, you may be texting me or something like that, and you go into a tunnel. Uh, when you get signal back, the entire system takes care of itself, and uh, it's last right wins for the operational uh, transform of your data, and everyone syncs very nicely. So we have a Realm Object Server uh, instance running in the back, and I can edit some data, call this some. This is round tripping all the way to the server. So you can see that I'm editing some data with, uh, here's a new name. And you can see the data changes quite nicely. So it scrolls really fast. This is written in Electron by one person. And this has now finally got us into a different market of people who are using uh, Realm on Windows as well and Linux. So this is Realm Studio. This We hope to get a lot of feedback and uh, what we can do more with Electron in the future. So this is a pretty amazing feat that uh, Electron has allowed us to do. Uh, we're really surprised that Realm.js has worked very nicely with front-end frameworks that wasn't intended for such a low-level use case. Cool. Awesome. So those are the few demos. I had to cut my slides in half because I realized that I had uh, too much to show. So in, in January, I'll have a pretty awesome demo of a chat application that uh, will excite you guys a lot. Cool. And so uh, we're announcing um, an experimental try for Realm on Electron. I think you guys should all check it out. It is a native database in C++. It's very, very fast. And we'll try to make your application a lot more robust and feeling very buttery and smooth. So your customers are pretty, going to be pretty happy. And also take, take a look at Realm Object Server as a way to use uh, Realm as a collaborative editing platform as well. Cool. Any questions? Oh. Uh, yeah. I'll, oh, I was pretty annoyed. I was like, um, I started off as like a JS engineer, and then, well, I've done C++ and JS, but there was no like, Bridging, there was no like world in between uh, C++ and JS until Node kind of came around. And uh, Realm has always been focusing on mobile applications. And uh, we always said like, hey, let's make mobile applications, uh, you know, feeling really fast, you know, having tons of data, low memory footprint, all that sort of stuff. And I said, um, okay, cool. Let's see if uh, we could do this with Electron. Electron allows us to run C++ with Node.js code pretty nicely. And I just like, whipped up an example using uh, these virtualized lists, which is very similar to UI table views or async table adapters. And uh, it worked. And I shoved in 4 million objects. And I started scrolling at 60 frames per second. And I was like, we need to do this. And that's kind of how it happened. Um, 
our uh, JS team was pretty reluctant to go into another uh, a platform, but seeing how the company really in, enjoyed the fact that we were able to be uh, on Windows and Linux with minimal effort was pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. So um, our database, as you edit them, so if, say, for example, um, we're doing a chat application or an ex or like kind of an Excel spreadsheet sort of application, um, and I go in into a tunnel and I lose signal, um, I edit some data. Realm has a sync layer that understands what data you're editing and then creates an operation and then queues those operations up when reachability has been uh, successfully obtained. It streams up those operations. The server uh, then merges, uses a merge algorithm, and then dispatches the next set of operations to you and to your other clients. Yeah. Right. So right now, as of my discovery, uh, yes, again, against multiple renderers, totally fine. Um, right now, we're having a little bit of trouble with the main process, so be a little bit wary about that. So. Uh, it's totally fine against uh, render processes. And uh, if you are pointing the local file of the realm uh, to two different locations. So you say you and I are syncing the products realm. You could sync the products realm to a directory. And then if you want to open up in a completely different process, it's best at the very moment to open it up in a different directory and sync those down. So you'll have two sync copies at the moment, but that's the best way to do it across processes. Awesome. So I'll finish up with two things. This is Realm Studio. This is the URL. Uh, download it. I'll give you guys a copy of the slides for sure. And uh, this is my email. So come and check out some of our next uh, meetups for Swift and for Android. And the last thing is the next time we're going to talk about it, we're going to show you our offline first chat, which is using Electron React Native uh, iPads on Swift and Android. So it's a full cross-platform fun stravaganza. So, and I have water bottles. So if you guys come, come and are, want metal water bottles, see me. And stickers as well. Cool. Thanks a lot. So we're almost done. What I'm going to do for the next few minutes is I'm going to try to convince you. I'm going to basically front load the call to action. I'm going to convince you why participating in the Electron community is worth your time. Um, so as you may have noticed in the uh, invitation, the main reason we're having this meetup again, um, let me just start the presentation here. Um, the main reason we're having this meetup again is because the uh, Electron maintainers community, which is sort of a bunch of people that care and invest into Electron, um, were kindly invited by GitHub to attend a portion of their private meeting that they have uh, every now and then where GitHub essentially syncs their own team. Um, and they were kind enough to invite us along to participate in some of the talks that happened during that time. Um, all of the talks. Oh, there was, no other there was no other meetup. How exciting. Cool. Um, and I basically wanted to tell you a little bit about that and our experience and my experience as someone who doesn't actually work for GitHub, right? But it's heavily dependent upon Electron. Um, and basically talk a little bit about uh, what it is like to work in the Electron community and do things like this. Um, and as it turns out, this meetup is actually one of the results of the meeting in Tokyo because we were sitting together with a bunch of people and somebody was like, shouldn't we have a meetup again? And I was like, yeah, we probably should. It's been a while. We probably should have another one. And now we're all here. So um, that's kind of nice. Um, but first, just a teeny tiny, oh my god, I hate Google Slides so much. You put this beautiful like Apple emoji in there, and then Google comes along and it's like, you wanted that. That's the emoji you wanted, uh, because it's better. Oh, man. Anyway, uh, going back to the actual presentation. So as you may or may not know, Slack is an Electron application. We uh, pretty strongly believe in Electron. Uh, we think and still believe that Electron is one of the best ways to build a cross-platform app. Um, I always tell various, various operating system providers 
that I would gladly use anything that is better, but so far I have not seen anything that is proposed as an alternative, um, which sort of breaks all the comparisons down because so far I haven't seen anyone who threw another hat into the ring, right? Um, Electron is solving a pretty complicated problem that I don't think, I don't think enough people realize. Um, but what, what Slack is doing is uh, we're trying to work on Electron itself. Um, we try to be proactive. Um, whenever we open up an issue, we also try to open up some kind of PR, even if it's terrible. We're just like, we tried. Um, this is what we tried. We have one engineer working full time on it. Um, and what we do more and more is that we provide open source solutions for uh, common problems that people have. Um, Paul, Paul Spellchecker was mentioned before, right? Paul used to be the lead engineer on the Slack desktop app. And if you open up many of the um, many of the communication apps built on Electron today, chances are very high that you're going to find the same spell checker that runs in Slack. Um, and the same is true for various other modules, right? Like I, I build a module around Windows notifications. Uh, Charlie built a module around Mac notifications. There's all kinds of stuff um, that we make publicly available. So we pretty strongly believe more so, I want to say, in the community than the, the concept of forever until ever after building with Electron. We think right now this community of cross-platform developers is pretty strong and maybe the one of the biggest assets. Um, and that is important to that is important to remind ourselves by because every single time I go on Hacker News, people uh, explain to me how easy it is to build Slack. Um, as it turns out, it's just a list uh, with maybe some images, um, which is wonderful because the internet is filled with these comments, right? And I think I'm. <sighs> Every single time this happens, I'm like, where do I even begin, right? Like, I, I've been doing this for a while, for a few years now, and like the, the first thing that I always do is like, I don't think enough people realize what an engineering feat it is to play back a random video file on all three operating systems. I don't even care about anything else. Just like take a video and play it on all three operating systems, right? Like the last company to achieve that is the video land player, which rightly so, was called a genius endeavor by multiple people, right? Like, since, since VLC, we haven't found another tool that is capable of playing your, your dumb video file on all three operating systems. Um, and there hasn't really been one before, and there's probably not going to be one for a long time after, because doing things cross-platform, as it turns out, isn't as easy as people think, right? Um, displaying a text list might be easy, but embed that YouTube video, why don't you, right? It gets a little bit harder than that. Um, and the Electron Maintainers community is magical, because it is a bunch of people who truly care about cross-platform. We all want to implement um, the best possible solution, the best possible experience for our respective customers. And we want to do that um, with, you know, without making giant compromises around things. Sure, it is very easy to build a list that is cross-platform, right? And maybe you have enough money in your company to build um, the tool that is capable of playing back YouTube videos for this one operating system, maybe two, right? But um, doing it on all platforms, making sure that your customers always have the best possible experience. As it turns, it turns out, it's actually kind of hard, right? And I used to be at Microsoft, and we had this discussion around Visual Studio Code all the time. Um, and uh, I would contest that one of the reasons Visual Studio Code is so successful is because writing add-ons for it is so very easy, and Adam, as it came before, too, right? Um, having NPM available for add-on developers makes a pretty big difference. So. With all that said, um, the community is amazing because we all have, sort of have the same problems, and we have very, a very unique set of problems, right, that few other people run into. Um, my favorite will always be sending a Windows notification, which, as you might think, is an easy problem. But as it turns out, if you do it like a few million times a day, sometimes it doesn't work, and things get interesting then. Um, my favorite bug is, and this is, this is a real bug that we actually had to fix. Um, there was a bug in Korean input on macOS that somehow allowed you to enter a backspace which is a character. It is a backspace character. It can be in your text. You won't see it, but it can be there. Went up to Slack servers, stayed in the text still the whole time. Nobody cared. Came down to your Windows machine, at which point it would go into the notification. And the Windows notification system would also not care, but would give it to a thing called Nitro, which is the underlying subsystem that manages Windows notifications, and that would freak out quite a bit. Debugging that is hard. Um, because, uh, you know, you can't see backspace. It's very hard to find. <laughs> and may I, may I also add that Slack cares deeply about our customers' values, so I had to figure this out without actually seeing the message, which makes this harder and more difficult. Um, so yeah, these maintainer summits are sort of magical because we're all sitting in a room and we're all caring about the same things and we all have 
slightly different priorities. We're trying to shoulder the work that is required to get to wherever we want to be on multiple companies, which is extremely efficient. Whenever you're trying to do something by yourself, chances are that you're going to get roughly there. But if you want to do it really, really well, um, it's probably useful if you put multiple companies onto it. Um, and uh, as always, if you care about something, it's not necessarily that you have to do it yourself, but you should do something, right? Um, just opening up an issue and being like, hi, I'm company XYZ, I would like X, and then disappearing forever, chances of somebody else being completely bored and one, you know, we talked a lot about how good C++ is today. Few people do that for fun. I never wake up in the morning like, what did I say today? I guess I'm going to write some C++ today for a random company that is not paying me money. Um, so, I don't know, it really happens. There's people who are like that, but, you know, usually it doesn't happen. So, um, what is interesting about these summits is that it allows all of us that work on Electron, or at least contribute a little bit to Electron, to sort of sync up and figure out what our priorities are. In addition to that, it's also truly helpful to just meet a person face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, that Electron engineer that I talked about that Stack is paying full-time to work on nothing but Electron, none of us have met that person in person before because he's based in India. And as it turns out, uh, entering the United States these days is neither fun nor easy. Even if you're okay with the not fun part, it's not necessarily easy. If you're, you know, not white, because this is a great country. Um, uh, so um, just meeting people in person is already fantastic and makes future collaborations so much easier. Um, and I just wanted to point out, um, you will sooner or later see some of the results of this work. Um, the first big result you're going to see is the, uh, the new versioning policy, which is now public, and you can see it. But oh, no, the uh, Zeke already updated the Markdown file. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so these are the things. This is just a literal copy of the agenda. Um, what Jacob organized, and I think that was a really good concept, was that we basically all wrote in these little post-it notes what we care about, what we think our biggest pain points are, where we would like to see things go, right? Um, and then we put them all on the wall, and then you have a thousand little post-its that people care about. But as it turns out, you can't fix everything. You can't realize every single feature, right? And some features are just might not make it into Electron Core. They might make more sense in your own little node module that you wrote yourself. Um, and once you condense them all down, you condense and condense and condense again, you end up with this little list of what we were able to talk about in one week. Um, and I think, I think it's fascinating to hear what all the people working on Electron care about. But the thing that I'm trying to achieve here with this talk is that maybe you're looking at this list and you're like, those are nice things. I don't really care. I care about thing X, Y, Z. And then maybe at the next summit, you will be there too. And you will be the one owning one of these items. Right? That's the, that's the great idea, and that's how many things actually made it into Electron. Um, so the first one is security. Um, for the first time ever, we um, had uh, what I'm going to call, quote unquote, big wigs from both Microsoft and Google in the room. And we talked extensively with security. And I think we have many ideas and, and um, a lot of momentum behind making sure that Electron is not only more secure by itself, but also making it easier for people to write secure Electron apps. Um, one of my one of my favorite activities these days is to like open up every single new Electron app that comes out and like do a little five minute pen test, right? Be like, did they do all the things we put in the README? Oh, they didn't? Great. Um, so in the future, for instance, if you install Electron 1.8 and you're trying to load a remote website with Node enabled, you might see a little warning message brought to you by me because I don't think you should do that. It's a bad idea. Um, things like that. Um, and then also fascinating is that we, uh, I don't actually know how Jacob managed to do that. I think it was just because he's a great diplomat. He managed to talk to Google about the upcoming certification of Chrome. Um, if you don't follow Chromium development closely, you're not alone. Nobody really does. But it's fascinating to do because so many things are moving at the same time. One of the big things that are happening um, at the beginning of 2016, Google wrote an experimental browser that basically split all the individual pieces apart and was like, what if the browser was just like a thing that was using various components um, and would use all those components individually to create the thing that we now is coming in the browser. That would have a huge impact for Electron if you think that's sort of like five years into the future, because maybe if you have all these things already split up into little components, it will be less difficult for us to actually break the pieces that we want out of Chromium, right? Um, which makes things interesting. Uh, one thing that always comes up is feature and build modularity. It's a thing that everybody wants, but nobody really cares enough about actually build which is a very common theme in open source in general, right? There's always like this one thing that everybody wants, but nobody really wants to build. 
And I think this is the closest that we have in the electron world because it would be amazing if you could say, oh, this is my magical version of electron that includes all the things I need. It doesn't include all the things I don't need. And now my app package is 10 megabytes smaller. The trouble is that everybody would like their app to be 10, 10 megs smaller, but nobody wants to put in the months of work to get those 10 megs. So if you do, this one is up for grabs. Um, <laughs> it's an exciting project. I can heavily recommend it. Um, uh, and then uh, the last two things are interesting. One, one are the 2.0 wish list, which is essentially everyone getting in a room again and thinking about what we want to do. Um, and the last one is sunset, right? Like, what does is, what is Electron look like in a perfect environment? And um, every single time I talk about Microsoft, Microsoft is very convinced that Electron shouldn't really need to exist, but I guess it does, right? Um, Microsoft is the maker of Windows. Um, it's also one of the companies putting the most resources behind Electron. Um, back when I was at Microsoft and worked a lot on Electron, people always came to me and were like, just you wait until DevDiv comes around and hears about all the things that you do. DevDiv is the division that makes all the build tools, including Visual Studio. And uh, um, they were, I, I was always like, ah, it's going to be fine. But I was worried what people would think, right? Because there's like politics involved if you try to build and use a new platform. Um, uh, picture my surprise when I saw the new Visual Studio 2017 installer based on Electron, right? Um, so, uh, even if you think five years into the future, it's interesting to see that most of us, including Slack and everyone else, we're not necessarily married to Electron as a product. We're most married to the concept. And Electron might be the closest thing we have to like perfect plus platform support um, that actually allows you to use native code. Right? That's the tricky piece. So <clears throat> with that said, um, the way this usually works, uh, work this time, is that um, one of our extremely good-looking uh, contributors gets up. And uh, um, this guy, by the way, is amazing. Um, if you have noticed that Visual Studio Code now has uh, a terminal that is blazingly fast and probably faster than anything else that runs on your machine, 120 frames mm -hmm. per second, he built that, which is extremely impressive. Um, he wrote a blog post about it. If you ever want to know how like, you can take performance engineering to the extreme, why don't you build your own terminal in Visual Studio Code? It's very impressive. It's a great read. Um, but anyway, there's like a lot of discussion going on, a lot of writing on certain, certain whiteboards, um, and then the discussion is taken on asynchronously on GitHub. People just talk about what kind of priorities they have, and then eventually um, it ends up in a PI that looks like this, right, um, that documents various new versioning processes. Um, and there's going to be more information out there soon, I guess. Um, so yeah, uh, this was just one giant talk where I'm like, if you care about Electron, and you're thinking about betting your business on it, and you're thinking about investing serious serious amounts of time into building an application, I would also invite you to participate in the community. Um, it's already pretty big, and you will probably get more out of it than you will put in. All right. Um, that said, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, we can probably hang out here for like at least another 40 minutes if you want to. Um, and uh, we'll probably have another meetup in January. And yes, thank you, Carl, for pointing that out. If you find any of the things that I talked about interesting, or you find Electron interesting, um, actually, I have a question for all of you. How many of you are already working with Electron, like your main job? Cool. How many would like to? There's a few hands. I see you. All right. Um, so, you know, Slack, good product. People tend to like it. Uh, uh, we have nice offices. You should talk to Carl. <laughs> all right. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much. We're going to have another meetup in January. Um, but for now, thank you for coming to this one. <laughs>